All right. Hey, hey, Professor Grammy here. And we are moving into our next lecture. And this is on delivering your speech or delivering presentations. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, I think that having a really effective delivery can really enhance a speech. Um, just take it to the next level. So let's get started. <clears throat> so we have four different speech delivery options that a speech could fall into. The first one is manuscript, and this is literally reading uh, word for word, think broadcasters, right, anchors, uh, reading off of a teleprompter, or a president, or governor, or a mayor reading off of a teleprompter. Um, it's really restraining body movement. Usually there's a camera uh, that is um, chest or waist high, uh, not a lot of hand gestures, um, not a lot of uh, emotion being shown. Um, just because of the nature of what they're speaking on usually. And so it could be possibly misinterpreted, uh, but those that are seasoned at it are do a wonderful job with it. Uh, oratory, this is memorized. Think performing arts, engaging with your audience, think theater, that's oratory. Third is impromptu. This is you either love it or you hate it. This is speaking with little to no warning and some people thrive in these settings and others uh, get weak at the knees <laughs> with impromptu speaking. And a couple situations in which you might find yourself speaking um, in an impromptu setting would be uh, maybe in a debate setting. So you might prepare your side, but then the way in which you rebuttal is, is in, in and of itself impromptu speaking, right? Because you don't know what they're gonna say necessarily and then you have to speak off the cuff and uh, pretty quickly um, to respond to them. Another thing, I mean, obviously everyday life, when you're meeting uh, for coffee with someone or just chatting, um, uh, a business partner, whatever it may be, you don't quite know how that conversation is going to play out. Therefore, I mean, you're kind of impromptu speaking. And then my favorite example is job interviews um, when you're pitching yourself. And you can research the company, you could research the person that is interviewing you, but at the end of the day, um, you're not, you don't really know what they're gonna ask you. You can try to look at questions that interviewees um, might ask, but interviewers rather might ask you. But again, that's only just a little preparation. In the moment, they may kind of throw you a curveball, and so you have to really think on your feet, be very professional, and that's impromptu speaking, okay? And the final one is extemporaneous. And again, you guys know this is my favorite word. This is speaking very off the cuff, yet you are very knowledgeable. It's very outlined and um, detail-oriented, and then you're practiced, and then you can kind of speak on it. That's really what we focus on in our course, um, so public speaking. Uh, the first, well, the two major speeches fall into this category, let's say that. Your informative and your persuasive speech are 100% extemporaneous speeches. Uh, for time's sake, we're not going to watch this TED Talks. It's a fantastic TED Talk. So please do click on this link. I don't know if it actually works right now. Something was wrong with it last time I was playing with it. But if it doesn't, um, all you have to do, it's the second most watched TED Talks of all time, um, it, you just Google. Her name is Amy Cuddy. So A-M-Y-C-U-D-D-Y, and just look up Amy Cuddy TED Talks and it will definitely come up. So watch the best version um, that you can access on there. And a couple of things, I want you to listen for just the science behind what she's speaking on. Uh, she talks a lot about um, this power stance where you kind of put your hands to your hips. And if you go into interview settings, into giving speech settings, just kind of having that vote of confidence prior to that you will make a substantial difference and it will I mean it'll really show and there's a lot of science behind it so it's really quite fascinating what she is talking about here and in addition to that um, I do want you to kind of watch her own delivery uh, and nonverbal communication and see if you have any you know feedback that you could possibly uh, would provide her if for some reason she was you know our own speaker here um, so yeah, so watch it with that kind of evaluative eye, something that we speak about a lot in here. 
So let's talk about nonverbal communication when giving a speech. You really want to project your voice, uh, whether it be in an online forum, right, in videos, or even in person. I mean, I want you to fill the room, fill the space. Um, so whatever room you're in, I mean, I want anyone that's around, <laughs> whether it's even your entire, let's say you're speaking at your apartment, your house, uh, your condo, fill it. I want your neighbors to almost hear you. All right, so really project all the way through. Pitch, all right. Who has seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Probably the majority of you, all right. Uh, ben Stein, his character, he is their teacher in that. And he's kind of made a living off of it, uh, so good for him. But he speaks extraordinarily monotone. And, you know, if you remember the famous scene, they, he goes, Bueller, Bueller, and it's just a one level the entire time. Um, it cuts to shots of the audience and the students are literally falling asleep, some are drooling. I mean, they're showing you they're bored <laughs> out of their mind. You don't want to come across as a monotone speaker. You really want to have fluctuation all right, in your tone and keep it appropriate and, and have it make sense. And yeah, I think that's, oh, you know, one more example I guess I could give with this one is think about some of your, your teachers or professors, current ones, past ones, um, that where you thought, oh my goodness, I feel like I could fall asleep at any minute um, throughout every single lecture that they give. It's probably, potentially maybe because they're monotone, all right? And so I'm sure you can probably think of a handful in, off the top of your head. And the problem with being monotone is you could have a really exciting, fantastic topic or subject or I mean, class that they're even teaching, but if they are monotone and the way that they deliver it, it could really lose the majority of their audience. Whereas maybe you have not as an exciting of a topic, but someone is really engaging, has a lot of fluctuation in their tone, and then all of a sudden the audience perks up and they gain a bigger audience base because of that. Um, so there's a lot that rides in that. So really I want you to focus on practicing those fluctuations in your tone. Uh, volume. So we could yell really loud <laughs> and wake up every neighbor in your neighborhood, but I don't want you to do that. You don't want to yell at your audience. I mean, could you imagine if I made all of these videos or if I was in a classroom setting and just started yelling and, and using the biggest possible voice I could possibly use, um, it might scare off some folks. And so you definitely want to not do that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you don't wanna speak um, so softly that uh, your audience can barely hear you and really what they're left to doing is reading your lips. Okay, I don't even know if you can hear me on this video. I'll watch it back later and see. Uh, but you don't want to speak so softly that we can literally not hear you when you're not coming across as effective. Um, so volume can also be used to emphasize certain points, really pushing some areas and pulling back at times. Um, and I want you to use this creative um, or rather conversational um, rate of, of, of volume uh, as if you were having a conversation, but maybe just enhance it a couple notches. So the rate of speaking, this is also so important. You don't want to talk so fast that your audience has no idea what you're saying because you're not even taking a breath in between every single statement and you're just trying to get through your speech as fast as you possibly can because you want to stop talking. <sighs> Take a breath. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to speak that fast actually uh, for me, but some people are naturally inclined to talking that fast. And the problem is, it comes across as not conversational. It sounds like you're rushing through. It sounds like you're nervous. And so you really want to kind of sit into it um, is a term I like to use quite often. On the other hand, you don't want to speak so slow. Okay, I can't even do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. Because it's, it's so frustrating for me if someone, um, if I speak that slowly, if someone else spoke that slowly, you're sitting on the edge of your seat going, oh, what's the next thing they're going to say? And then all of a sudden, wah, wah, it's not that exciting. Uh, do not be the sloth 
from uh, Zootopia. If you know my reference, um, you know what I'm talking about there. The whole sloth scene is hilarious. You definitely don't want to make that a, a habit for yourself, though. Again, speak conversationally like you were having coffee or lunch or dinner with someone um, and just really kind of sit into it. Um, it should be a nice flow, a nice rate of speaking. With pronunciation, this really lends itself to you being more credible. Uh, knowing how to pronounce words, what words mean, using them correctly, all plays into this. Don't say a word or mispronounce it and then think that people are going to think you're credible. They're going to think quite the opposite. If you've ever heard a broadcaster or a sportscaster mispronounce a name or a city, all of a sudden you go, what the heck? Didn't they do the research ahead of time? Didn't they look at how to pronounce that word or that name? What are they talking about? And it really lowers their credibility. So we want to practice this and really hone in on that skill. With articulation, um, this is a, a very important one. That I feel like it's overlooked quite often, but articulation is really rounding out every single word and statement so that people can fully understand what you're speaking about. And it's the clarity, it's the forcefulness as you kind of see here. You don't want to mumble. That's an, a mistake I see quite often where people will speak well and then kind of towards the tail end of their statement, it almost crumbles. It, it just kind of fizzles out. And that is them mumbling. They're like, da, 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 da. and I want you to finish each statement as strongly as you began it and really focus on that articulation throughout. If any of you have strong accents, uh, this is a really good exercise to practice your articulation. Um, it doesn't mean it's a hindrance to you. It just means this is something that uh, can really help aid in, in a strong accent that might not come across as clearly um, uh, as others might. <clears throat> One thing that you could do, take a pen or a pencil and put it vertically, uh, not vertically, um, like horizontally, that might hurt, uh, horizontally in between your teeth. Okay, and it's going to be really difficult because you're going to be talking like this <laughs> the entire time. Uh, but if you do that, maybe practice your introduction uh, with that. Okay, something kind of short, just a few statements. But what it does is it forces you to literally round out every single word around that pencil or pen. Then when you take it out, now you know what the word should actually sound like if you're fully articulating it to the best of its ability. Okay. Um, inflection, when I use this word, it's really the sum of everything here. Uh, it's all of this. If I say, hey, work on your inflection, it's, I probably want you to work on a little bit of your tone, your volume, your rate of speaking, so on and so forth. Make sure that you have pauses in your speech. Oftentimes, students think, oh my goodness, I got to get through all of this. I have too much information and I'm just going to keep going. Purposeful pauses are fantastic, okay? It really helps with the effectiveness of your speech and, and audiences are gonna go, oh my goodness, <laughs> what are they gonna say next? Um, it's much different than you speaking really slow and then nothing really happens. Um, but again, these are purposeful pauses. And oftentimes, really all the time, when you have a filler, you have an abundance of them and you're saying, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in between majority of your words, honestly, you should be putting a pause there. That is what naturally should be going there in place of that. So try to do that. If you find yourself saying those fillers more often than not, take a breath, pause, then go to the next statement. We tend to want to fill space and time with something because we think pauses are awkward and uncomfortable. So we put a filler in there, which comes across less credible. So try doing that technique and it may show a huge significant difference for you. It's really important to take care of your vocal uh, cords, especially if you want to be a teacher or a speaker of some sort, um, or just in general, I mean, it's really important to take care of your throat and your, the, the whole system. Okay. Cause if this isn't working, uh, a lot of stuff isn't going to be working. Okay. Uh, one thing, if you're a smoker, I, I would decrease that, if not eliminate it completely, 
it's going to have a, a long-term um, and possibly short-term effect on your vocal health. Overusing it. So you may have had a favorite artist, uh, band member in the past that they had to go kind of on a hiatus for a while and possibly, you know, the, they had to postpone a tour and you thought, what the heck happened? In most cases, nine times out of 10, it's probably because they got laryngitis. And it's usually because of overuse. They kind of pushed it too much and then went beyond the limit where they kind of lost their voice and, and strained it a little bit too much. I would even say in my first couple semesters of teaching, uh, I was teaching five, six classes, really pushing my limits um, in the beginning. And it kind of put a strain on it. About halfway through the semester, I would feel that and probably once or twice got a little bit of laryngitis for, for probably a day or two and then it went away but i started to recognize oh that is what that means pull back learn to you know really hear your body listen to it um, and and try to remedy that a couple things to avoid um, aspirin medications in general that can just have an effect on your overall vocal health or health um, alcohol, definitely don't drink the night before giving a presentation. Um, it will have an effect. If you've ever even drank or had a long night, you might have even lost your voice the next day. So just be smart about those decisions. And think about when the temperatures fluctuate, hot versus cold, hot versus cold, what happens? You usually get sick, a cold, a flu, something happens because our bodies just don't know how to um, you know, to, to kind of deal with that back and forth fluctuation. So just think of those natural remedies that you usually go to the sipping hot water with lemon or tea, honey, um, gargling hot salt water, not too hot, don't burn yourself, but that usually helps the throat too. Um, so all those natural remedies can really help uh, with your vocal health, okay? So a couple of visual cues. Um, although we are live uh, via Zoom, Again, as we spoke about in one of the other lectures, you're gonna see classmates, okay, on your screen. Um, hopefully you'll be on a computer and you can kind of see them. And I want you to scan the audience or even just kind of look to the room that you're speaking in as if there are different audience members right there. Um, that way you're kind of getting into practice and the, um, the swing of things for once you do actually present in front of a live audience. Uh, one thing I like to recommend is with each statement, okay, each, each phrase, each, uh, each sentence, look to a different audience member. That way we're engaging all audience members in our speech. Don't just look to one, okay, don't creep them out, uh, but look to different ones, right? And don't scan like this, that'll make you dizzy, all right? So just, again, each statement, new audience member, keep them excited and interested. Um, in the US, it's, it's important to note that direct eye contact is a sign of respect, so it's really good to get in the practice of that. So facial expressions and hand gestures, these are always enhancing what you're saying. So really try to match the verbal message with what you're doing non-verbally, all right? Um, appropriate and natural. So a couple things here, a couple things to avoid really. Uh, oftentimes, more for the gentlemen than the ladies, but not always. Um, is two things. Uh, one, they like to put their hands, um, some people, uh, right here, all right? And we call this the fig leaf. You can figure out why, all right? I don't need to explain that to you. You really wanna avoid that. You never wanna cross over your body, right? Crossing your arms, crossing here, because um, it's really showing your audience that you're closing off to them. Uh, another one that they wanna, or you wanna avoid would be the hands behind the back. Uh, I call this the prisoner, and it's something that I literally want you to break free from. Um, again, although this is closing off your body, this is showing almost a sense of superiority that you don't want to come across as to your audience because you want to be relatable to them. So think about that, utilizing your hand gestures. I know in an earlier lecture, we spoke about the box where your hand gestures should be, so I'm just going to remind you of that right now. And that's between the shoulder and the hip, all right? And so they should be really natural, really purposeful, matching what you're speaking about. And when you're not utilizing them in the box, keep them down at your side. Although it may feel uncomfortable, it doesn't look as uncomfortable as it actually feels. 
Um, so it's gonna help you keep your posture together as well. So all in all, um, utilizing that box, not conducting an orchestra, not doing a little raptor arms, but really being natural and appropriate here is gonna be overall very effective for you. Um, oh, one more thing, a couple other ones to avoid. Um, I, I noticed a handful of students will kind of do the one arm grab and they'll swing around, okay? And then they'll kind of switch and they'll do this. You can't see my legs right now and sometimes they'll kind of cross them. We kind of flip around. <laughs> you definitely want to avoid that. It shows that you look very uncomfortable, kind of in your own skin, lacking a lot of confidence, and we don't want to come across that way when we are speaking. Um, so really just be very sure of yourself, be matter of fact, um, and hold your posture and composure together. Uh, posture, again, we, re we spoke about this in one of our earlier lectures, but just as a reminder, um, we have something called planting. And again, I know you can't see my legs, but just imagine you could. You want these to be shoulder width apart and um, not too wide. We're not doing yoga and not too close because you'll teeter totter. And any of my medical experts, nurses, doctors out there, people that have those um, in their family, you will know if you lock the knees, what happens? It stops blood flow to the brain and someone could possibly pass out. So do not, I repeat, do not lock your knees. What you wanna do is have a little bit of give to them, not too much swag, uh, but a little bit of give so we have some movement um, and, and maneuverability in our posture. You definitely don't wanna pace. I mean, obviously you're gonna go off screen in some of our video uh, presentations here, but if you were live, you don't wanna pace. Oftentimes people think, oh, well, isn't that a great sign of utilizing floor space? No, it actually looks like you are nervous and anxious and trying to get those nerves out by moving too much. What you wanna do is utilize the walk that we spoke about, having your introduction spoken in the center, stepping one or two steps forward. Again, I would push your, your video back so we can see you, um, but utilizing this space here from main point one, moving into main point two here, being able to pivot a little bit Kind of imagine there's like a one foot by one foot box around you in which you can, you know, kind of look to different audience members, but we don't pace. Again, main point three, walk one or two steps this way and back to center for your conclusion. So before the speech, examine your speaking space. All right, um, look at what you got working with you. Uh, if you only have a couple feet, work with it. If you got more than that, work with it. Uh, walking up to the podium, well, we're not really doing that in Zoom, but think about first impressions always. What kind of effect are we going to have on our audience members? Um, what kind of impression are we going to make on them? Attire. I am a huge advocate for dressing professionally, um, really putting your best foot forward, whether that be for an interview setting, whether that be for presentations. So dress to impress. Think about your first job interviews. Um, how would you dress for that, right? How would you want to go up against the competition? Um, so for guys, nice slacks, nice belt, collared shirt, tuck it in, iron it, um, nice shoes, a, so not tennis shoes, but an actual, um, uh, you know, like an, a nice business shoe uh, with socks, either Argyle socks, black, brown, um, maybe blue. Uh, but some sort of business sock is what I usually recommend to people. Um, you want to stay away from the athletic or the ankle socks. Again, put your best foot forward. Some people throw the tie or the blazer on with it if they have it. Um, but if you don't, don't worry about it. But think business casual. Don't go break the bank. But hopefully you have one of these things in your, uh, in your closet. Otherwise, borrow from a family member uh, for our speeches. For the ladies, same thing, think professionally, nice slacks, knee length skirt, uh, not mid thigh. Again, uh, think conservatively, modestly, a little bit more. And nice blazer or cardigan with a nice blouse, okay? Um, a nice shoe, close toed flat or small heel. And yeah, so think about all of those things. Again, professional job interview, that's what I'm trying to prepare you for shower that day. We don't have to talk too much about grooming, but really just, again, putting your best foot forward. I can't reiterate that enough. 
Um, but just brushing your hair, doing it that day, looking, uh, you know, just top notch, your best. Connecting with the audience, I really want you to make them feel the same that you do about your speech. So be sincere, be authentic, don't act, um, really show that you're excited. Uh, listen, engage their reactions. Again, watch on video or if you're live, look at their nonverbal communication, adjust your speech accordingly. Finally, practice, practice, practice. Use your speaking outline that we spoke about. Utilize note cards. Work on the time limit. Time it each time you give it just so we can get it to be consistent. Use vis visual aids if need be. A practice audience. Watch your time. Finally, you can videotape yourself to really get some good, solid feedback. And um, beware of mirrors, it says. Again, practicing in front of the mirror isn't going to give you the same feedback as actually videoing yourself and watching it over. And that is it. All right, if you have any questions about delivery, please uh, feel free to leave a comment or um, shoot me an email about it. Otherwise, happy practicing, and I will see you guys on the next video.